Everybody in place, finally, and we are ready to do NFL Live. Dan Graziano here with Josina Anderson, Darren Woodson, and Lewis Riddick. It is the first day of summer vacation in the NFL. All 32 mini camps are now done, and training camps are about five weeks away. Players and coaches scatter for the summer, but we are taking a look back at the offseason with an eye toward the season to come. So with that in mind, I want to ask you all to start the show. What is the number one storyline that emerged for each of you throughout this offseason and the minicamps. Lewis, you're first. I'm going to start with Kirk Cousins. Look, we just saw you know, his little video clip there. As he said it's all about winning football games in Minnesota. Well, mm. you darn right it's all about winning football games because they have to justify this guaranteed contract that was unprecedented, record-setting for him this past offseason. And look, there's already been a little bit of talk about the fact that his red zone efficiency so far in offseason workouts, mini camps has not been where he needs it to be. You know that was a thorn in the side of the Washington Redskins and maybe one of the reasons why he is not there anymore. So, look, I think for him, heading into training camp and into the regular season, we know it's all in. It's boom or bust with Kirk Cousins in Minnesota. Aaron Woodson, what do you got your eye on? I'm going with the trendy pick in the San Francisco 49ers. Look, we always thought they would be three to four years off as far as personnel coming in. But then you get John Lynch coming in as a GM. He's made a great, made great adjustments. Brings in a genius in Kyle Shanahan with that offense. And we're starting to see the places come in to peak. The pieces come into place right now to bring in Jarek uh, McKinnon this year. Staley still there. Uh, you got guys like uh, Garoppolo who's won five straight games last year. So I'm looking at the San Francisco 49ers of being. The, the pace being ready for them next year to really compete for that division. You are nothing if not trendy. Josina, what do you got? <laughs> guys, those are all great headlines, but I'm also looking at the guys who were not there. I just think it is a very big statement about these guys really starting to get vocal about what they feel like their value are. And I'm talking about Earl Thomas, Khalil Mack, Aaron Donald, uh, David Johnson. Uh, who else did I not get? Julio Jones. Julio Jones yeah. uh, when they redid uh, the CBA in 2011 and they slotted these rookie salaries, the idea was that these veterans, these older guys, were going to get paid. And instead, you have the owners holding on to the money. Guys like LeGarrette Blunt only getting a year or two years and two million and things. That was not the idea. So to see how these things pan out by the time the season starts, I'm waiting to see how, how about it these guys are when it comes to how long they're going to hold on to these positions. A lot more guys willing to accept those minicamp fines uh, in exchange for the big payday that comes down the road. One thing that jumped out to me was uh, a little bit better outlook than expected for some of these big-name quarterbacks that are coming off of injuries. I'm looking at Deshaun Watson looking good in Houston. Carson Wentz, who we saw, doing a little bit more maybe than expected at this point in Philadelphia. Andrew Luck finally throwing a football at long last. Uh, Ryan Tannehill looking good in Miami. We'll have more on him a little bit later in the show. So, speaking of big storylines, Odell Beckham Jr. is always a big storyline, and he was at Giants minicamp this week, coming off an ankle injury that cost him most of the 2017 season. And he has a new head coach who had this to say about him. I think we're just still getting to know each other, um, but I have a, a real – I've said it before. I This guy loves to play football, and he gets it as well. So, when I see him in the meetings, when I see him here on the field – Regardless of what he's doing, when I see him on the field, he's really engaged. And you can see just by him running routes versus air and some of the drill work we're doing um, that um, he can really help us. Has he told you he'll be here? I haven't talked about that with him. You take two more. I expect to see everybody here. Beckham is certainly a great deal more engaged at this point than is Le'Veon Bell, who was not at Steelers minicamp at all. Bell is a different kind of holdout since he's a franchise player who hasn't signed his tender and therefore technically is not on the Steelers' roster. Unless he gets a new deal by the July 16th deadline, the Steelers probably won't have Bell in training camp either, but they saw this movie last year and they know Bell will be back when the real games get started. Mike, what are your expectations for Le'Veon in the next few months? You know, I expect him to be ready, uh, to be ready to be a big component of, for us in, in 2018, and he's been around us long enough to know and understand and embrace that. Bell's one of five players who got franchised this offseason. Jarvis Landry, of course, ended up signing a long-term deal with Cleveland after getting traded from Miami to the Browns. Three others, Demarcus Lawrence, Ezekiel Ansah, and LaMarcus Joyner, signed those one-year franchise tenders, while Bell has once again, for the second year in a row, chosen not to sign his. Again, teams have until July 16th 
to sign those franchise players to long-term deals or else they can't negotiate with them again until after the season and those guys are stuck playing on those lucrative, but not as lucrative as maybe they want, uh, one-year franchise deals. So we talked about this being sort of summer vacation, right? The league shuts down for the next month, month and a half. But there is that July 16th deadline for these guys. So in a front office, what yeah. goes on with regard to that kind of stuff the next few weeks? Well, it's, it's not like every day they're going to be hammering on this contract and there'll be negotiations. Yeah. Look, there will be some dead time. There will be some time where there isn't much conversation going on. I think both, both the teams and the players know where they feel as though they're going to come in at and where they need to be. The players know what they want. The teams know may pretty much where the high side is as far as where they will go as far as these deals are concerned relative to that July 16th deadline. And we'll see if somewhere, like I said yesterday, you know, deals are always about both sides not really quite being happy with the way it turns out, but, we, but they're willing to concede enough to get the deal done. And that can happen very quickly, or it can be something where there's this silence and you know, absolute crickets and nothing gets done. So we'll see. Every team takes a di- different tactic. It's all about relationships between agents and relationships between the agent and the chief contract negotiator. And this stuff can come together very quickly, but we always know this, and people say this a lot in the NFL, deadline spur action. As we start getting into July and you start getting into that second week, we'll know a little bit more about what's going to happen. Well, there's, there's got to be a lot of anxiety for the players. I mean, I've never been in that position as far as, you know, holding out or about to hold out and be in this process. But, you know, this is a sensitive time for a lot of these guys. Le'Veon Bell has been through this process in, in the last couple of years. He's ready to get paid, and he knows his clock is ticking. He's going to be 30 years old. 30 years old here soon. So you got to get your money when you, when you can. And I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety for all these players that are holding out right now. I think it is about what is the current tone between Le'Veon Bell's representative and management? What's the state of those talks? Yeah. You know, how, how has it been going? How aggravating is it? How irritable is it? You know, do they have a good relationship? And then on top of that, I think it's about how hard is Le'Veon Bell going to stick to the number that he wants? Because that is going to come up with Le'Veon. It's going to come up with Odell. It really isn't just about getting a deal. It's about getting the deal that you've been fighting for. It's about getting the deal that you feel like showcases your value. And then after that, even after you get it, are you going to be happy? And then how will that translate to your performance or your relationship with your camp and your representatives after all this time? So that's what for me is going to be really interesting to see. One of the problems with Le'Veon, though, is his franchise number is $14.5 million. And the next highest paid running back right now is who? Devontae Freeman at like eight and a quarter. Eight and a half, that's yeah. a big gulf between the number two guy and the number one guy. So that's a, that's a hard place to figure out where to land in the middle is, of that, right? I'm sorry. And you know what's interesting about that is that his franchise number is actually what it used to be when Chris Johnson and Adrian Peterson were getting their deals back in 2011. So his one-year figure is close to where he's trying to get, but it's not about the one-year value. It's about what are you guaranteed at signing? What are you making over three years? What are you definitely walking away with no matter whether you're on the roster or whether you're not? And that's why the whole APY thing is really not, is not where it's at, you know? I wonder if uh, David Johnson in Arizona is a guy to watch because if he gets a big new deal, maybe he, you know, he's, he'll likely surpass that Devontae Freeman deal by a couple million a year. Maybe that helps set a market for Le'Veon. But in order to do that, it has to happen before July 16th. <laughs> so what can we expect from Ryan Tannehill this season? After going eighth overall in the draft to the Dolphins in 2012, Tannehill started every game in his first four seasons and went 29 and 35. And in 2016, he won eight of his 13 starts while helping lead Miami to the playoffs. However, he then suffered an ACL injury that caused him to miss the final three regular season games and the Dolphins' playoff game. And in August of 2017, Tannehill tore his ACL and was forced to miss the entire season. You have to go back to December 11th, 2016, for the last time we saw him in live game action. Two years ago, when Adam Gase became the Miami Dolphins head coach, he said part of what made the job appealing was the budding potential of Tannehill. But after all those injuries and all that missed time, Tannehill feels like a little bit of a forgotten man around the NFL. Inside the Dolphins' locker room, however, coach and quarterback are quietly building confidence ahead of the 2018 season. Our man Jeff Darlington got to spend a little time with Tannehill this week down in Davie, Florida. Quarterback Ryan Tannehill will need season-ending knee surgery. The Dolphins starting QB injuring it in practice. A devastating blow for the Dolphins. We're out here where it happened last year. We don't want to bring up bad memories, but I do want to know how that changed your perspective in terms of your outlook on your career. 
I think it gives me more appreciation for the day in and day out. Uh, you know, just being at practice. Obviously, uh, when, you, when you have an injury, you think, oh man, I'm going to miss the games the most. And, and I did miss the games. It was really hard for me to sit on Sundays and, and miss the games. But the day in, day out of being with the guys, competing, uh, leading them, pushing them to get better each and every day, that was the hardest thing for me. It's just seeing it happen and not feeling like I was a part of it. Where are you right now as it pertains to your rehabilitation? I feel really good. You know, I'm uh, doing everything. I've been doing everything all spring. So I, I had no limitations coming into spring, which is really big for me. Uh, I'm going to keep working throughout the summer and be ready to go for the fall. Well, I think Tannehill is the key. The entire success is going to be on Ryan Tannehill's production. What have you seen to kind of illustrate what this team is now, maybe compared to what it was? Well, I just see guys that come in and buy in immediately. You know, you see guys that work hard every single day, uh, put their head down and, and just work and, and not complain and, and just try to do the best that they can do every single day. So eight yards, sell it, take off. Off. Oh. There's really no controversy right now in Miami. Adam and the team didn't even draft a quarterback. Did that mean anything to you? I mean, it's nice not to not to have to deal with the distraction of it. You know, it wouldn't have changed anything for me and how I prepare and, and how I uh, lead this team day in and day out. Good work. Keep doing it. No doubt. Keep getting better, right? Each and every day. Push yourself a little bit better each and every day. How confident are you that this will be the best year of your career? I'm confident. You know, I think that that's the goal is you want to get better each and every year. I think Coach Gase has, has taught me a lot of great things the past two years. Uh, we have a great quarterback room. We push each other day in and day out to get better, and there's no choice but to get better and go out and perform. Last time Tannehill played, his top target was Jarvis Landry, the wide receiver the Dolphins traded to the Browns this offseason. Landry's 400 receptions since entering the league in 2014 are the most by any player in his first four seasons in NFL history. So, Tannehill and that Dolphins offense, they need to find some new answers. This offseason, they brought in wideouts Danny Amendola and Albert Wilson, as well as veteran running back Frank Gore. They also used a second-round draft pick on Penn State tight end Mike Gesicki. So, Darren, we look at this Dolphins offense, minus Henry, plus all those new guys. What do we think their chances are? Look, I... I... The, the, the division is dominated by the Patriots, as we just mentioned. But when you look at Adam Gase and what he's done in the last couple of years, what he's trying to do is build a locker room and trying to get the culture of that locker room the right way. He let Jarvis Landry go this, this, this past season, move on. He's let Julius Thomas out, gone. Uh, Jay Ajayi was just last year. So he's trying to build the presence of guys that are going to follow his lead. And I think that's what you're seeing now. You saw the names on that list. Danny Amendola coming in is a big, big time, uh, a uh, guy coming in as far as working the middle of the field for this football team. I like what I'm seeing in this. I know I think they're taking a step back personnel-wise, but I'm, figuring, I'm thinking that they're looking at their culture of that locker room and trying to build off of that. Yeah, I think this is a perfect example of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Look, the individual parts here, when you look at them piece by piece, are not going to get you very excited. There aren't a bunch of guys on the offensive side of the ball that you're going to say, these guys are just game breakers, and these are guys who one-on-one are going to win games when you need them right. to, Right. But it's going to be about execution for this football team. It's going to be about complementary football, marrying the run with the pass. And first and foremost, and probably last, it's going to begin and end with that guy you see on the screen right there, Ryan Tannehill, who Adam Gase has thrown his full support behind and still believes he is a top-flight quarterback in the NFL, barring injury, and when he is healthy, that he can make all the difference in the world. Look, they, they have a couple exciting players. Now, look. Kenyon Drake is someone who they believe yes. is going to absolutely explode this year, and he is a dynamic run-pass threat. They have tried to shore up the offensive line. Josh Sitton is a big addition at left guard. They need him to play well. They need a guy like Devontae Parker to come on. They really do. They need Kenny Stills to be a big play guy. They need Danny, Danny Amendola to be exactly that what you said, well. the veteran glue, the culture guy, because they're banking on all that stuff. They're banking on the true team developing here, not a team full of superstars. Uh, you talked about the fact that the teams need to execute, that being the Dolphins. But you know how you execute? You execute with talent. And a lot of that talent has gone out the door. And so, to me, the onus is not just on Tannehill. It's not just on the people that you have there. But it's on Gates to be able to show that he can bring the people together that he has. I'm a little bit concerned with the fact that you bring in Danny Amendola uh, you lose Jarvis Landry. That yeah. might be a push in terms of the production right there. Jay Ajayi talking about, well, you're trying to build a culture, but he seemed to build a culture in Philadelphia. 
you know, with those pieces. So uh, you talked about D- Devontae Parker needing to step up, hasn't started more than 12 games, has never received more than 750 yards in a season. Yep. So, uh, you know, to me, it's about all of those players needing to execute, but for the head coach to show that he can bring all that together now yes. that you've done all that. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you know, we just talked about it as far as allowing guys to move on, you know, and losing and Dominic and Sue. On that mm-hmm. defensive front, oh, it's a huge locker room guy that, that you know, and the, the culture may not have been the right way. It starts inside that locker room. And if you can get all your guys on the same page, get them to buy into it. And sometimes it's hard to have a veteran guy who's been around for a while and you have a young coach and they're going back and forth and there's a lot of bickering going on. You can't have it. you got to start anew. you got to start fresh all Look, over he, again. The Dolphins are going to play the Jets twice this year. Jets don't know who their quarterback is yet. But uh, they used the third pick in the draft on Sam Darnold. Uh, So that's one team in their division. Uh, Rich Samini, our Jets ESPN NFL Nation reporter, has a little bit of a report on the Dolphins division rival. Thanks, Dan. The biggest takeaway from Jets mini camp, Sam Darnold will be a legitimate contender this summer in the quarterback competition. Uh, He'll go into camp as the number three guy on Todd Bowles' depth chart behind Josh McCown and Teddy Bridgewater. But that could change. I talked to teammates and coaches about Darnold, and what they like are his smarts and his anticipation, his ability to throw receivers open. Now, the one knock on him in college was that he fumbled too much. So what we saw in minicamp was Darnold in drills, holding the ball with two hands as long as possible, all of it filmed by a team cameraman. Now, that, of course, will be the big question in training camp. Who's the starter? Right now, I'd say McCown is a slight favorite, but do not rule out the rookie from USC. Back to you, Dan. Arizona Cardinals drafted a quarterback in the first round, too. They moved up to number 10 to take Josh Rosen even after they signed Sam Bradford for $15 million guaranteed dollars. So, ESPN NFL Nation reporter Josh Weinfuss, how's that going? Thanks, Dan. Minicamp was proof that the Cardinals' plan to limit Sam Bradford's reps during OTAs worked. During this week's minicamp, Bradford saw his reps increase day by day. He also took part in the team's 11-on-11 team drills for the first time this offseason. That allowed him to step up in the pocket and face a rush. But we all know the biggest question surrounding Bradford is whether or not he could stay healthy long term. The question will first start to be answered during training camp. And if he can't stay healthy, Josh Rosen is waiting in the wings. Back to you, Gras. Yeah, Josh, that is a big story with Sam Bradford during his career. That health, he's missed multiple games in five of his eight seasons. And since 2014, Bradford has missed a total of 33 games due to injury. Lots of changes in Arizona. Carson Palmer retired. Bruce Arians retired. Steve Wilkes in as a new head coach. Larry Fitzgerald's still there, of course. But really, everything comes down to the quarterback. So, Lewis, what do we think about Josh Rosen's chances out there in Arizona? Yeah, I I don't think that Josh's chances of starting necessarily have to coincide with Sam's lack of health. I think this really could be a performance type of issue. And, look, when you have a new head coach like this who really comes in and really does try to wipe the slate clean and say, look, everyone here is going to earn their spot – do not be dis- do not be misled by the fact that Sa- that um, Rosen that yeah that, that Rosen is a rookie. Do not be misled by that, and don't be misled by the fact that you know the veteran quarterback here is making a lot of money because it's really not a lot of money relative to what other starters are making in the NFL. All right, so look, if he was sitting on the bench making twenty million a year, so be it, or fifteen million a year, or ten million a year, so be it. They're all about performance when you have a new program and you have a new coach like this. And Josh Rosen is not to be taken lightly. He is a guy who has Great. shown it in college. Forget all the stuff that you heard about the fact that this guy, you know, could be immature, has a very, you know, well-rounded mind, has a lot of outside interests. So what? Who cares if he came from money? So what? That doesn't mean the fact that he, doesn't, that he won't want to compete. Like I said, I know plenty of players who came from nothing who didn't like the game either. Right. Okay? They played because they just wanted the money. So, look, this is, this is really, to me, one of the most interesting quarterback battles of training camp this year, simply because this guy that you see on the screen, I think is someone that I think we may be underestimating a little bit. Look, I, look Josh Rosen is not going to sit idly by and just be okay with not playing this year. He's going to compete during training camp, and I like his attitude. I know a lot of people take shots at his attitude about being a little cocky and sometimes arrogant. I like the fact that he knows what he wants. He wants to be a superstar in this league. He wants to be the starting quarterback, and it's okay. And if you're in that locker room, if I'm one of the players in that locker room, I want my guy, my young guy, to be competitive that way. So I think 
It's not, it may not yeah. be, like you said, medically, it may not be that Sam Bradford gets hurt. It may be that Josh Rosen just flat out outplays him. I think that he's definitely going to give Sam Bradford a run, you know, for his money in terms of the competition and training camp. And I think there's also a reason why people compared him to Aaron Rodgers in terms of that, having that chip on the shoulder, that confidence that he, you saw in the draft when he was saying all these teams made the mistake, nine mistakes by not getting me. So you like that. But I still think at the end of the day, he's not going to start the season because when it comes to just maintaining mental confidence, that development with your progression uh, mentally and things like that, I think you have to be careful when you're throwing him out against certain defenses and defenders, how that could shape his mentality moving towards the season. And don't forget, even though Sam Bradford has been hurt, he had some durability issues. Remember how he started off the season yeah. against the Saints, mm-hmm. 84% completion. I mean, he was killing it in that first game. So he can still do it and has that experience behind him when he's upright and on the field. Obviously a storyline to watch when the Arizona Cardinals get back there for training camp.